Mitch, you can come on tonight. Amen. She's going to be singing for us, y'all. Pray for them as they come tonight. Amen. Yes, Lord. Amen. But then when they get done, you can come on, brother. All right. Amen. I be Romans 12, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say to the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one member is one of another, having then gifts differing, differing according to the grace which is given unto us. Whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the portion of faith. Our ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cling to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love, and honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing instant in prayer. Distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you. Bless Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as life, then you live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thy enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Romans 12. You've been my friend. You've been my friend for so long. You were right when I was wrong. I can't repay all the love you've given me. You were my friend when no one cared. I was alone, but you were there. Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. Borrow treasures, borrow dreams, all life's joys you've given me. When troubles come, you're always there to make me smile. So come what may, thy will be done. I love you, Jesus, God's only Son. Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I owe it all to you, Lord. All I have is yours, Lord. Take my life. Make it what you'd have it be. For I'm your child and you're my father. I'm the clay and you're the potter. Lord, you're the best thing that 
that's ever happened to me. And for every time I fail, each time I stumble, sin prevails, you pick me up and plant my feet on solid ground. Why you love me, I don't know, but I'll keep singing as I go. Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I owe it all to you, Lord. All I have is yours, Lord. Take my life. Make it what you'd have it be. For I'm your child and you're my father. I'm the clay and you're the potter. Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I owe it all to you, Lord. All I have is yours, Lord. Take my life. Make it what you'd have it be. For I'm your child and you're my father. I'm the clay and you're the potter. Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. Lord, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me. Who is refreshing like an ocean in the desert? As lovely as the flowers in the snow. Who is as watchful as an eagle or her young ones? As gentle as the summer breeze that blows precious Jesus sweet rose of Sharon there is peace and triumph when you speak his name loving Savior my my guiding star that's shining on the day who is the one who understands my burdens but when he smiles he hums a happy melody a liberated soul can sing about being bound for Without looking back and realizing he set me free. Precious Jesus, sweet rose of Sharon. There is peace and triumph when you speak his name. Loving Savior. Star that's shining all the day. He's my guiding star that's shining all the day. He's my guiding star that's shining all the day.
Amen. So it's good to be in the Lord's house tonight. And uh, just want to thank the pastor and the church for the opportunity to be here tonight. And uh, I want to thank the Lord for my family. Uh, you know, I'm so thankful for my family, so thankful for a good Christian woman that uh, stood by my side. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, when you go home and you tell them, you know, God's called you to the mission field, uh, a lot of them think you're crazy. And, uh, you know, my wife, uh, I just want to say she's been right there by my side. Uh, I'll never forget when I got called to mission field about eight years ago. Uh, we had a nice house there in Abingdon, and, uh, you know, I had a good job. She had a good job, and the uh, Lord started opening doors, and I started traveling. I had to leave my job, and I'll never forget, um, I came home, and I, I missed my wife. She wasn't able to go with me. She was uh, working. I was going about eight or 10,000 miles a quarter, and I came home, and I told her, I said, we're going to sell our house, and I said, we're going to buy something, uh, you know, paid for. And, you know, she started saying, well, you know, we're going to have this, we're going to have that, but anyway... Uh, I thank God I was able, uh, I found a house, and I mean way back in the woods. Uh, uh, my wife, she's from Bristol. She's a city girl. And I found this house that had been sitting empty for eight years. Uh, the brush was growed up around it. You couldn't even see the house for the brush. And it's on a road called Earth Road, which is a dirt road. Our, the closest house on that road, they have, still have an outdoor john. And uh, anyway, I, uh, I found us a house, and uh, she said, I want to see it. So anyway, she met me there at lunchtime, and uh, I'll tell you, this house, I thought, well, she's coming over here, it's over. But uh, she walked, got out of the car, walked around, and she said, I love it. And you know, the thank the Lord, we, we was able to get that house, and uh, we sold our house in Abingdon, but uh, we love it over there. I mean, we're out in the woods where her sister says, you know, it's Earth Road, her sister says, it ain't the end of the earth, but you can see it from there. And uh, But anyway, God has blessed us so much, and it's been so good what God's done to us. We hadn't been here, I think, in about four years or so, so just want to tell you a little bit about what God's done. Of course, we live in Medivue now, got a Medivue address. and uh, But anyway, um, got to thinking about the things God's done, and uh, it's been amazing. Uh, we started Mission Field eight years ago. And we've now had the opportunity, you know, we do the resource clinics where we go into cities. We have preaching, free food, Bibles, reading glasses, haircuts, medical screening, clothing, hygiene. Uh, we've done those, and uh, we've done outreaches now in over 20 states here in America. Uh, back in last June, we were able to go up to Maine, help one of our supporting churches up there. They started a ministry uh, where they go out into two of the neighboring cities, and they bring people in on buses on Sunday morning. They have a meal for them. Uh, so they bring them to church, and they have a meal after church. And uh, we went up there and did some work with them. We had about two people on each bus. Uh, but now they've got over a dozen people coming on each bus every Sunday. Uh, they've had several people that's been saved out of that ministry. They've had some that's joined the church, and that ministry continues to grow. Uh, back before COVID hit, we were doing about seven resource clinics a year. Uh, we were able uh, the last two years to do two resource clinics we had Last year, we had one in Bristol, one in Mountain City. A uh, year before that, we had one in Bristol, one in Ocoee, Florida. Uh, this year, we've got one scheduled in Bristol. I'm praying that we'll get some more scheduled. Uh, but uh, since COVID hit, it's, uh, that's kind of slowed down on that ministry. But uh, then in 2019, we started a nonprofit organization called Thanks to Calvary Baptist Ministries. Our goal at that time was to plan a homeless mission there in Washington County, Virginia area. And uh, but to make a long story short, uh, I got a call during COVID. When COVID hit, uh, the Haven Arrest Salvation Army, they wouldn't let nobody in. Uh, nobody could go there and take showers. Brother Mark Vestal called me from Maker Baptist Church, and he said, Brother, he said, why don't you come down and do a shower ministry for us? So we started in April of 2020. When everything started closing down, I was wondering, what are we going to do? We went down and we started doing a showers of blessing ministry, we called it. Uh, we brought people in. We had showers. We had a little bit of food. And uh, we kept doing that for a while, and I got to praying. And I told my wife, I said, I wish that we could have this building and put a day center over here. Well, Brother Mark came over one day. I never said nothing to him. He walked in. He said, hey, brother, he said, you ever thought about putting a day center in this building? I said, I've been praying about that. Amen. So um, anyway, in December of 2020, after we met with the church and uh, our board, we all met and we agreed uh, to use that building uh, Anchor Baptist still owns the building at this time, uh, but uh, we took over all the utilities, all the maintenance in that building over there, and we were able to start the day center in December of 2020. Right now, we're open three days a week. We are looking for volunteers. Uh, if you could commit to vo a volunteer, we'd love to have you help. 
Even if you can do one day or even a half a day a month, we'd love to have help. Uh, we want to be open five days eventually. And, uh, but right now what we do is we're open from 9 to 3, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. At 9 in the morning, uh, we bring them in. We run the buses. We come back around 9. At 10 minutes after 9, we have a little devotion. So we take the men and the women. We split them up, and we have a little devotion. And right after that, we eat breakfast. Uh, and during that time, we lock the door. So in other words, you got to come to devotion in order to eat. Uh, we do the same thing at lunchtime, 1130. We have a preaching service. Brother Corey comes down and preaches for us once a month. We have different preachers come in because we want them to know a familiar face when they're out somewhere. So we have different preachers come in, and we do the same thing. We lock a door. Uh, we start at 1130 after we get done eating, then we open the doors back up, and y'all can tell we eat good. Uh, we don't go hungry down there. They get all they want to eat. Uh, Lord's blessed us there, but we also have showers for them. Uh, we have washers and dryers. We have computers set up to help them find jobs. Uh, we've been working for low-rent apartments, which uh, that's not government housing, just low-rent apartments. And, uh, of course, that's been harder and harder to find here lately. But we've had at least a dozen people since we started uh, over a year ago. I know there's been at least a dozen people come through there that now they've got full-time jobs, they've got houses, they've got places to live. Um, we've got several people right now who are looking for houses but they can't find it. We also have those who just refuse to work. We love on them too. We share the gospel with them. But uh, as long as they come to church, they get to eat and they get to take part. But uh, we've had a great time there, and the Lord's blessed us truly. And uh, so I want to thank God for that. I want to brag on God for, you know, a lot of people, they say 2020 was so bad and all this. But let me tell you, I thank God for COVID. Had it not been for COVID, we wouldn't have started that ministry. And I thank God that ministry was born out of COVID. And then... Uh, as y'all know, I got a daughter. I want y'all to pray for one of my daughters. She's out of God's will. She's out of church. And, uh, you know, I want y'all pray for her. But also, once again, I just want to tell you, I don't take too much time because I want to get the message, but uh, I just want to tell you back in December, I guess y'all know, uh, my family and I at Christmas time, uh, we all had COVID. And, uh, you know, we. Uh, but anyway, I just want to thank God during that time, you know, uh, things got pretty bad. And, uh First day or two, I thought, well, this is fine. I even, I even called some of my pastor buddies. And I said, hey, I'll be back in a couple of days. Don't worry about it. But we ended up, we had to shut down for, what, three weeks. And uh, anyway, my oxygen, I didn't feel that bad, but uh, all of a sudden my oxygen started dropping. And uh, I went to the doctor, you know, and uh, I called my doctor, and uh, he said, well, he said, we can't do nothing for you. He said, we can't order nothing without seeing you. He said, we can't see you because you got COVID. But my oxygen was getting in the 50s and 60s. And uh, so anyway, I went to the doctor. They put me on six liters of oxygen. On six liters of oxygen, I'd go to the restroom, and it would still drop to about 58 with six liters of oxygen. And, uh, but anyway, I got a call. Brother Tim Crucenberry called me up, and he said, Hey, you want some great news? I said, What's that? And Emily, she got out of church, and she didn't want none of God's people. She didn't want to be around God's people. But during COVID... When I got bad, she started reaching out to God's people. And I say, thank God, because now she's going to church half the time anyway. So I thank God for that. But uh, during that time, I'll never forget, I sat back there in the bedroom the first few days. I didn't think nothing about it. I just said, you know, Lord, uh, heal me and all that. And I didn't think it was going to get bad. But then when I got bad, and uh, all the rest of them had it, uh, so I got to go in there and sit in my recliner. And uh, after about... Uh, Three or four nights of my oxygen dropping like that. I sat in there one night talking to the Lord, and I started realizing, hey, this ain't looking good. And, you know, the Bible says come boldly. So I started talking to God, and I said, God, I said, the word of God says come boldly. And I said, I'm coming boldly. I said, you know, I said, I've got three daughters. And I said, I want to see them marry good Christian men. I said, I don't want to leave my wife. I said, if you're ready to take me home, I said, I'm ready to go. I said, I don't want to leave them, but I said, if you ain't taking me home, I said, what are you waiting on? I said, I'm tired of laying here. And uh, I, they was in the bed. I don't know how they didn't hear me because I started talking to the Lord, started having a good time. And I just, I, you know, I said, Lord, I said, you healed the lame, you healed the blind. I said, the lady of the issue of blood, I said, she touched the hem of the garment, and I raised my hands in the air, and I said, Lord, I said, I just want to touch the hem of the garment. I said, I'm tired of laying here. I want to touch the hem of the garment. And I tell you what, I had a peace come over me. And uh, I just laid there and went to sleep. Well, the next morning, my phone started ringing. 
I had a good friend of mine from Augusta, Georgia, called and said, hey, can we pray? I said, absolutely. Had another good friend call me from Alabama, said, can we pray? I said, absolutely. Had a call from Mountain City, Tennessee, another missionary, can we pray? Started getting calls from Maine, South Dakota, all over the place. Can we pray, brother? I said, absolutely. And I was able by the end of the day to reach over there and turn that officer down the curry. I could walk where I wanted to and it stayed up. Next day, one and a half. Next day, it was gone. You say, holy mass, I touched the hem of the garment. God's good. God is good. So, you know, I thank God. And, you know, people, they, you know, the, we, we think we got it at a church or something, but I'm going to tell you, hey, I got to preach. I got to share the gospel, so I'm going to tell you, I say, thank God. God's good to me. I can't complain about it. And uh, we need to live our lives. We need to share the gospel. And, uh, but I'm excited about what God's been doing in our ministry. Y'all pray for us. And uh, like I say, we're praying to get enough volunteers to open five days a week. Uh, we've been blessed. We've seen, uh, we've seen over a 1,000 souls saved in our ministry, not bragging on us, but bragging on God and what God's doing. That's been the last eight years, but God has been so good to us. And, uh, but tonight, if you got your Bibles, I'm going to read one verse in Proverbs chapter 9, and then we're going to go back to Proverbs chapter 1. Before we get started, I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear, gracious Heavenly Father, come to you tonight. Lord, I want to thank you for this great honor for us being in your house here tonight. Lord, I want to thank you for the great spirit very felt. And Lord, I just pray tonight, Lord, as I try to preach or teach whatever you want me to do tonight, Lord, just pray you come down and speak the words to me tonight, Lord, for I'm nothing here tonight. Lord, you're the preacher. You're the teacher. Lord, I pray I can get myself out of the way. Lord, I pray for any sin, any hindrance, anything in my life, Lord, that may stand in the way. Lord, I just pray we get that fixed up now. Lord, I pray we help to somebody. Lord, I pray for somebody in your house tonight hurting, Lord. I pray, Lord, that they can find help tonight, Lord. I pray for that one here sitting that may be hit at a place called hell. If there's one in that condition tonight, Lord, I just pray you put a conviction in their heart. I pray they won't walk out the same way they come in, Lord, that they'll come to know you. Lord, we thank you for this church, for this open door, for all you're doing in the ministry. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for that blood tonight. Lord, it's still saving old sinners. So thankful, Lord, for that blood. We love you tonight. We want to welcome you into the service. And ask you to please have your way. We want you to get all the praise, all the honor, all the glory, Lord, for everything that's done that's good. Lord, it's all you. We do nothing, Lord, but we love you tonight. And we want to thank you and welcome you. And we ask you all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. First, I'm going to read Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy understanding. I got to thank you today. We need the fear of the Lord. We need wisdom today. We need that knowledge today, that holy understanding. We're living in a day where we don't have that fear anymore. We don't understand today. We don't have that knowledge that we need. That's why today we got all these verses of the Bible. We got all these things today because we don't have God's holy understanding. But it all comes from that fear of the Lord. And I got to thinking about how today, here in America today, we need to fear of the Lord. And then I got to think about what Proverbs tells us there in chapter 1, verse 1. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instructions of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity, to give subtility to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. So, you know, I got to thinking about these things, and I got to thinking about, first of all, there in verse 2, it says, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. You know, we've got the words right here, the word of God in front of us. We need to understand the words. The, that, that word perceive means to knowledge. Or to receive. We need to have knowledge of this word of God today. We need to know what this word says. It says in verse 3, To receive the instructions of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity. We need to receive the wisdom from this word of God. We need to get in this word of God and we need to study. And we need to realize today what it says. And we need to receive that wisdom today from God's word. But then it goes on in verse 5, says, A wise man will hear and will increase learning. A man of understanding shall attain into wise counsels. 
So a man of understanding shall attain to wise counsel. Wisdom comes from God. That's where wisdom comes from. So attain from wise counsel. That means that we'll gain from wise counsels. And I got to thinking about the day we're living in, boy. We're messed up. You say, what do you mean? We don't want wise counsel. We don't attain wise counsel. We don't go for wise counsel. You say, what do you mean? Today in the church, our divorce rate. I, somebody said that the divorce rate in the church finally passed the divorce rate out of the church. That's what uh, I heard a preacher say that. I don't know if where he got that from, but it, maybe it ain't true. But I'm going to tell you, divorce rate is up there. Divorce rate. You say, what do you mean? Well, today when a man and woman have trouble, instead of going to the pastor, instead of saying, hey, brother, we're having trouble, instead of hitting your knees, calling out to God and seeking wise counsel, they go on their job and tell their buddy, their buddy that don't know Jesus, don't go to church, and they say, well, I wouldn't put up that. I'd go down here and see lawyer so-and-so. I wouldn't do that. Go down here to the lawyer's office. We don't go to the man of God. We don't go to our knees. We don't go to seek wise counsel. I think about all the people today going to these psychologists. Let me tell you something. I know that there's a lot of people got depression. Depression's a real thing. I understand that. But here's the thing. There's good Christian psychologists. There's good Christian psychologists. You say, what do you mean? Today we become so smart. We got all these doctorate degrees. All these people went to these universities and they've got two or three doctorate degrees. They don't have a lick of common sense. You say, well, what do you mean? You can go give that counselor all the money you want to, but if that counselor does not know Jesus Christ and does not line up this word of God, they're not going to give you any wise counsel. All they're going to do is mess you up. They cannot give you wise counsel if they don't know Jesus Christ. If they don't have wisdom, if they don't have understanding, that's where wise counsel comes from. But today we don't want wise counsel. We want worldly counsel. I think about our guests down there. We got people come in and we'll try to surround them with wise counsel. You say, what do you mean God's people? We try to get God's people around them and we'll try to help them. And we'll try to tell them, you need to do this. You know, you need to get in a good Bible-believing church. And they'll start doing good. You'll, you'll start seeing signs of them improving. But then here's what they do. They go downtown to their buddy that's on meth, homeless, living on the streets, made a mess of his life, and received counsel on what they need to do. That's the way we get our counsel today. I'm telling you today, your friends out there today, if they don't know Jesus, you're going to the wrong place for counsel. We need today to go to God's people. We need today to go to God. That's where we're going to receive wise counsel. Somebody that don't know the Lord cannot give us wise counsel. But today, that's where we receive our counsel. That's why we're in such a mess today, is we don't want to do it God's way. But it says in verse 7, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So it doesn't determine the fear of the Lord's beginning of wisdom. But it says here the fear of the Lord's beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Well, we got a lot of fools in America. You say, well, what do you mean? We've been out places in America. You can go in there and you say, hey, we're from the church. Go to homeless camp. We're from the church. I don't want nothing you got to say. I don't want to hear that. God sends God's men out. God sends people out today for wise counsel, to tell people about Jesus. But yet when you go to them and you try to share the gospel, I don't want to hear that. I don't want nothing you got to say. We're living in a world they don't want to hear wise counsel. They don't want to hear that stuff today. They'll push you away. Don't want nothing to do with God. Today it says that's foolish. It says fools despise wise counsel. Or fools despise wisdom and instruction. But verse 8 says, My son, hear the instructions of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. For they shall be an ornament of grace unto the head, and chains about the neck. My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood. 
Let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them up alive as the grave and whole as those that go down into the pit. We shall find a, subs a precious substance. We shall fill our houses with spoil. Cast in the lot among us, let us all have one purse. My son, walk not thou in the way of them that refrain thy foot from their paths. For their feet run to evil and make haste and shed blood, to shed blood. Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of the bird. And they lay wait for their own blood. They lurk privately for their own lives. So are the ways of every one that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of their owners thereof. So I got to thinking about these verses, and there's a lot in these verses, but I got to thinking first of all here in verse 8, says, My son, hear the instructions of thy father. We ought to be listening today to the instructions of our heavenly father. We ought to be seeking his will in our life. I mean, I got to thinking today, it seems like today it's all about me. What do I want to do? What 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 I want to do? You know, I think about even in the ministry. You know, I hear people all the time say, Well, I'm a preacher, I'm called to preach. Well, would you like to go preach? I don't want to go there. Nah, I don't want to do that. I want to I, I want to go here. Well, today we need to go where God says. We need to be about our father's business today, not the world's business, but our father's business. We need to be doing what he wants us to do. That's what we'll gain in that wise counsel. But then it goes on in verse 10 and says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. If they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privately for the innocent without cause. And then if we skip over to verse 15, it says, My son, walk not thou in the way of them. Refrain thy foot from their path. For their feet run to evil and make haste to shed blood. So he's warning us here. If sinners entice thee, he says, in verse 10, consent thou not. And then he tells us, he says, that my son, walk not in their ways with them. Refrain thy foot from their path, for their feet run to evil. You say, well, what are you talking about? We're living in a day where it seems like Christians, they want one foot in the world and they want one foot in the church. So today, we want friends out here in the world. We want the people of the world to be our buddy. Well, here's what happens. Oh, come on. Brother Dwayne ain't going to know if you go have that beer. He ain't going to know nothing about it. The church ain't going to know. Come on. They're going to entice thee. They're going to say, it's okay. You know what? You need new friends. You say, what do you mean? When we get born again, we need new friends. When I got saved, I didn't have no trouble. I ain't bragging on my sin, but I was an alcoholic. And you know what? I went to my friends, and I told them about Jesus, and they didn't want nothing to do with me. But today, people get saved, they get born again, but they still want to go hang out with them same friends that all they want to do is go lay at the honky-tonks. All they want to do is go do these things of the world. Oh, but they're my friend. Hey, let me tell you, we need to go tell them about Jesus. But we don't need to get sunk into that sin. We don't need to go back to those same old places and do them same old things. But we're living in a day people don't want to do that. I hear young people all the time. Well, I want to be popular. A lot of them argue with mom and dad. I don't want to wear those clothes, mom, dad. I want to wear what everybody else is doing. Well, everybody else gets to do it. Everybody else, they want to be popular. They want to fit in with everybody else. Let me tell you something, you. If you take a stand on this word of God and you live as a Christian, you ain't going to fit in at the schools. You ain't going to fit in if everybody else. You ain't going to be popular. But we need today to take a stand. We need to fear God back. We need to fear God. We need to do it our Father's way. Not the world's way, but our Father's way. We need to refrain from this bunch that's trying to get us out there. It says, so are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain, which taketh away the life of their owners thereof. And I got to thinking about the day center down there in, the, well, just Bristol in general. 
Sir, the ways everyone greedy again taketh away the life of their owners thereof. And I got to thinking about when we started down there. I ran into Greg Halston. I don't know if y'all know Greg Halston, but he was a police officer there in Bristol. And he left here just a while back, but I got talking to him and we was operating the day center. And I'll never forget one of the things he said. He said, buddy, he said, you better be careful. I've known Greg a long time. And I said, what do you mean? He said, they just soon cut your throat down here. He said, this place like New York. And, uh, you know, I found out Greg's right. I found out that Greg is right. We, we think here in southwest Virginia that we're secluded. We don't have that stuff. Let me tell you something. We've got sex traffickers right here in Bristol. We've got drug trafficking in Bristol. We've got people all over Bristol today. All this stuff is here. We don't have anything. We traveled all over America. And let me tell you, if you've got an interstate running through your neighborhood, it's there. It may be hid, but it's there. We've got it all right here in Bristol. But it says, so are the ways of everyone that is greedy of gain. The sake of way of life of their owners thereof. And I got to thinking about how people work their entire life to gain things. But we've got a society, they don't care. They'll come in, take whatever you got. They'll come in, they don't matter, it don't matter, they'll shoot you. It don't bother them one bit to kill you, to do whatever they got to do to get whatever you got, to get your money today because they're greedy of that game. We got people down here in Bristol, they'll sell their bodies. They'll do whatever they got to do to get that money, to get that game so they can go buy more of that meth. This place is eat up with meth. It's, it's terrible. I used to work at the Haven Arrest. We drug tested there. I can tell you just looking at it, everybody comes into day centers on meth. But down there, we tested them, and they's all on meth. Every single one of them, this place is eat up with meth. But they're greedy again. They'll do whatever they got to do to get that drug. They, they have lost their wisdom today. But verse 20 says, Wisdom. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief places of concourse, in the openings of the gates, in the city. She uttereth her, her words, saying, how long, ye simple ones, will you love simplicity? And the scorners delight in the scorning, the fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Because I have called and you have refused, I stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. So he's saying here, he stretched out his hand. He's tried to give a warning, but we've regarded not. But I got to thinking about, it says, she crieth out in verse 21. She crieth out in the chief places of the concourse. Verse 20 says, wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. So she's calling out in the streets, in the concourse, in the openings of the gates. You say, what do you mean? These large openings, concourse. I got thinking about here in the United States, we've got preachers today out in the streets. We've got people today telling others about Jesus. They're trying to warn about Jesus Christ, and they're trying to share some of this wisdom. But what does this say? They're just going to make fun, scorners. It says, and the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Like I said, here in America, we've been places. As soon as you start walking in, we don't want nothing you got to say. You know, I've preached in America. We think here in America, we don't face persecution. That's what I hear preachers all the time. Well, we don't face persecution in America. Let me tell you something. Here in America, preaching the Word of God, we've had guns pulled on us. We've had knives pulled on us. Here in the United States, I've had the law called on me many times in America for preaching the Word of God. Even in Bristol, Tennessee, they had a law called on us, handing out gospel tracts. Told us we had to buy a permit to hand out a gospel tract. You realize that here in America today, the preachers are trying to warn, they're trying to tell people about Jesus. But they hate it. They don't want nothing to do with it. You know, I preached down in New Orleans on Bourbon Street. We had witches come out. Said it's casting spells on us, throwed stuff at us, cussed us here in America. The preachers are warning. People's telling them about Jesus. 
But they don't want to hear that on our streets. People in America don't want to hear that. Today, they say, I hear a lot of people talk about America being a Christian nation. I don't think America is a Christian nation. Actually, I did a study on that a while back and found out that there was like 15% of people, I think it's less than that, in America that attend a church once a week. And when they talk about a church, that included like Catholics and everybody else. I mean, I don't think we're a Christian nation here in the United States. They don't want the gospel. They have strayed from the word of God. We've lost our fear. We've lost our knowledge. But then it goes on in verse 26. It says, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge, and did not choose the fear of the Lord. So I got to think about that and says, I also will laugh at your calamity. So that calamity, that's a great or sudden destruction. I got to think about God being a loving God. He is, but he's also a just God. So he's telling us here that he has told us, he has warned us. We didn't fear God. We didn't have any understanding. So he says, when that calamity comes, he will laugh. And it says, I will mock. And then it goes on and says, when fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. And I got to thinking about up there in Glade Spring. We used to live there in Glade when that tornado hit. And I got to think about that whirlwind. Come through there, let me tell you, it was just a few seconds, it's gone. It was over, just a few seconds, that whirlwind come through. God says he's going to mock, he's going to laugh. And I got to thinking about all these natural disasters, all these hurricanes, all these earthquakes, all these floods that we're seeing here in America. And then I got to thinking about right now, here in the United States. And you know, I'm not trying to get off on politics or nothing. I could do that. I mean, that'd be all night, but let me tell you. This is my opinion. I don't think the man in the White House won the election. But God allows everything to happen for a reason. So you say, what do you mean? God allowed this man to be in there because if it hadn't happened, here in America, we wouldn't be seeing gas for $4 or something a gallon. Here in America, we wouldn't be seeing all these shortages that we're seeing. I mean, we go to food country over there once in a while. Shelves are empty. They ain't no food. They're talking about running out of food. Everything is sky high. There are no houses. $100,000 house two or three years ago, they're selling for like $300,000. There is no cars. You say, what do you mean? There's no new cars. What are we going to do in two or three years when all these are wore out? They want everybody to have one of them battery cars. You say, what do you mean? God allowed it to happen, and I'm telling you, I believe God did it so he could pour his wrath out on this nation. This nation had turned their back on God. We had no fear of God. We had no respect to God. And we're going to pay for it, I believe. I believe today that's why we're seeing all this chaos we're seeing in America. The crime rate has gone up, what, 600% or something? The murder rate? Throughout America, it's dangerous. We're living in perilous times, dangerous times. But I believe today it all boils down to the fact that we've lost our fear of God. We've lost our knowledge of God. And he says he's going to laugh. When these times come, he's going to laugh. He says, they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. But then in verse 30, he says, they would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. So it's telling us here that the prosperity of the fools shall destroy them. They shall be filled with their own devices. And I got to thinking about what the word of God tells us in Romans 1 and 22. It says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Here in America, we've become so wise, we've become fools. 
Like I said, everybody today, doctors used to be in the hospital. Now everybody's got a doctor's degree. And there's no common sense. There's no common sense. I got to think about today how we despise wisdom. We've got all this book smart. We've got all this technology. But we don't need God. Those old times, you know, they, they didn't have microwave ovens. They didn't have dishwashers. They didn't have all these fancy things on their car and tell you where you go and all that. But you know what? They leaned on God. They had a fear of God. They called out to God. They didn't have all these nice things that we got today. But we've got all these nice things. And we become so smart we don't need God. I think about even in our churches today. You say, what do you mean? Even in the churches, we don't need God. You say, what do you mean? Well, I'm a missionary and I talk to preachers all over America. And let me tell you what they want to know. When you call a pastor up and you say, hey, we're missionaries to the homeless. We'd love to share a burden with you. They don't say anything about you calling to preach. They don't ask you about your qualifications to preach. They don't ask you about your salvation. Hey, where'd you go to college at? Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with going to college to further your education. I talked to a man a while back, and I said, we'd love to come share the burden. He said, do you have a doctorate degree? I said, no. He said, we ain't qualified. We can't support nobody who got a doctorate degree. And I said, okay. But, I mean, that happens a lot. But here's the thing. We have sent these boys to school. And don't get me wrong. If you're called to preach, there's nothing wrong with going to seminary. There ain't nothing wrong with going to further your education. But we have sent people to school to get an education because that's just what they want to do. They've come back and they have learned how to hold a church service. They can teach and they can preach, but they ain't the Holy Spirit in them. And they can go through the motions of having church. We don't even need God in our churches anymore. we become so educated. Look at our school system. Today, you can't find too many people can add or count or whatever because, let me tell you, we have taught our kids today to hate America, to be anti-God, and we've got away from the basics. We've become so smart today. We've got away from these things. And I got to thinking about how today we're in such a mess here in America. We need the fear of God back. We need the fear of God back in our schools, back in our homes, back in our church. But it says that they will be filled with their own devices. And I got to thinking about their own devices. Everybody today has one of those cell phones. And I'm going to tell you, you take a cell phone away from a lot of people, you might as well take a needle away from a meth head. You might as well take a beer away from an alcoholic. You say, what do you mean? They'll leave their house. Oh, man, that, if they forget that phone, they got to get back there. They can't make five steps about that telephone. Their Bible can lay there all week. It don't make no difference. They don't need their Bible. But, boy, they got to have that cell phone everywhere they go. And then we've got to the point now that we got a cell phone, so we don't need to go to church. We don't need God. You say, well, wait a minute, I would just sit home in our pajamas and eat our Cheerios and watch it on our telephone. You say, why is that? Because we don't need God anymore. We've become so smart. Now, don't get me wrong, Facebook Live is a great thing for those that can't come. When I had COVID, I thank the Lord for Facebook Live. I know that some people can't come, but a lot of people today would just rather sit home in their pajamas and not go to God's house. So today, we need, to, we need our wisdom back. But it says they'll be filled with their own devices, for the turn away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. And I got thinking about America. We were founded upon the Word of God. Look how far we've come. And I got to thinking about what happens when you become a, when you lose the fear. You know, I, I fear my Heavenly Father. So when I fear my Heavenly Father, there's a respect. I have respect for Him because I fear Him, and in return, I love Him. And the fear I have for my Father in Heaven I'm not worried about going to hell because he doesn't save my soul. But I have a fear because I don't want to hurt my father. So in return, I have respect for my father. But what's happened in America is we've lost our fear for our Heavenly Father. 
So therefore, we've lost our respect for our Heavenly Father. Well, then that goes a little further. Because when you lose the respect of God in the church, then it goes on over into the home. You know, when I was a kid, my dad would say, go out there and cut you a switch. And he would take that switch and he would wear you out. And you know what? Sometimes it left a blue mark. You know what that was called? Correction. But we got so smart that, oh, that's abuse. You can't, that one little mark on that kid's going to kill. That's abuse. No, we got to get rid of that. So they took the whipping out of the home. And I think we can go here in society and see that the butt whooping society produced better people than the time out society. If we go out there and we look at that, and what happened when they took that whipping away? They took that fear away from mom and dad which took that respect away from mom and dad. So now our kids talk to our parents. They run the house. They talk to them like dogs. They run the house because there's no fear of mom and dad. So we lost fear of God, so now we had no fear of our parents. And then it goes on over into the school system. Now when I was in school, I had a principal for a glade called Shrimp McCanna. People still talk about him. Everybody hated shrimp, and I did too in school. But I tell you, old shrimp, now that I look at him, he was a great, I don't know if he was, I don't know anything about his Christianity, but he was a good principal. When you got in trouble, you went in there, shrimp bend you over at desk, and he'd take that paddle, and he'd wear you out. And you know what? Put a fear in you. You didn't want to go back in there. So you know what? In school, we, we, we tried to behave. We didn't want to get a whipping. But I've got two kids that, well, Faith went for a year or so, but the other two, Danielle graduated public school. I've got another girl that went through the 10th grade in public school. And our public schools are an absolute zoo. There is no correction. They took the paddle out of the school, so now the kids do whatever they want to do, and nobody corrects them. You know, now they listen to their headphones. Up in Virginia, anyway, they listen to their headphones while the teacher's teaching, that's supposed to help them learn. But the thing is, they took the whipping out. So there are the fears gone in the school. The respect's gone for authority. So there, there's no respect in school, no respect in the house, no respect in God's house, no fear. Then we go on over into society. Go out there, and I had two cousins. Used to be police officers. And they used to tell them old stories, and they talked about going over to Damascus and they went over there one night and some guy got in a fight at the bar. They went to arrest him. He wanted to cuss him and throw a fit and didn't want to get in the car. Well, they had them billy sticks, you know. And they took them billy sticks, popped him in the head a few times, drug him to the car, took him to jail. Well, that was back where everybody got their own devices. Now everywhere you go, everybody got to think, oh, that's police brutality. That's police brutality. So now while they're doing, they're shooting the cops, have no respect for the cops, no respect for authority. I'm going to tell you, if you get in trouble for law, you need to put your hands out there, you need to let them put handcuff you, you need to go to jail. That's called respect. They need respect. They're doing their job. But the thing is, when we lose our fear of God, we become a lawless, fearless society. We have no respect. We have no respect of authority, no respect of laws, no respect of God's house. That's what we've become here in America, is a lawless, fearless society. You know, it's, it's a shame. We need the fear of God back. We need, if we fear of God, the Bible teaches us we'll respect those in authority, whether it's a parent, whether it's a school teacher, whether it's a, a police officer, whoever it is, whoever's in authority. On our jobs. You know, we represent Christ on our jobs. I work with a lot of people that, on a secular job, that all they did is bash the people all the time, but they're supposed to be Christians. We need to respect authority. We need that fear of God back in America. You say, well, it sounds awful bad here in America. Well, it is. But, you know, there's hope. There's, if, if we know Jesus Christ, here's, here's what I like, verse 33. It says, but whosoever... Hearkeneth unto me, shall dwell safely, and 
and shall be quiet from eat from the fear of evil. So even though we're living in a fearless, lawless society, we don't need to worry. Because you know what? My God's in control. He is in control. But I'm going to tell you, our nation needs the fear of God. Our churches need the fear of God. Maybe you're sitting here today and you say, Preacher, I'm saved. But are you straddling the fence? There's a lot of people today that's saved. But you know, they've lost their fear of God. They started straying because that friend come along. Oh, come on. Or old Satan come along. Oh, come on. So they start getting a little further away from God. And the further they get, then the less fear they have for God. The further they get into sin, the deeper they get in, the less fear they have for God. Some of the most miserable people in the world are those that know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but they've strayed and they've lost their fear. We need that fear back. I love you tonight, and uh, i just like to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I hope it's all right, Pastor. I'd like to ask uh, the piano player if she'd come play something for us. And,